Coming up on Inside Lehman, we're turning back the clock here in the Bronx. Take a trip back in time to see an amazing place where the days of glitz and glamour are back. Have you had any junk food today? If so, you're not alone. We'll tell you why health experts think America's kids are on the fast track to middle-aged problems. Plus, let's meet some of the people who are working on telling your computer what to do. So sit back and relax, because Inside Lehman starts now. Welcome to Inside Lehman. I'm Elise Reed. And I'm Maurice Mercado. You know, as you walk down the streets in the Bronx, you might be able to tell what life was like in past generations. The Bronx has many stories to tell, and a new website from the Lehman College Library shows us the history of the Bronx from a business angle. Here's Inside Lehman's Lou Gonzalez with that story. The Lehman College Library has opened a door to the past with its new website entitled Bronx Business for Everybody. It features a large collection of photographs, historical documents, interesting bits of trivia, and Chamber of Commerce records from Bronx businesses from the 1920s through the 1950s. Professor Janet Munch heads the project. In addition to the business pictures, there's street scenes. Um, so there'd be pictures of 149th Street, 138th Street, Fordham Road. Much of the important background information came from these historical records that were donated to the Lehman College Library by the Bronx Chamber of Commerce back in 1988. Library archivist digitized the collection with the help of a grant from the Metropolitan New York Library Council. Now the collection is available for those who want to discover the Bronx or take a look back at their past. I got an email from a man who um wanted to know if we had an additional picture of, of a particular business in the Bronx. And uh, it turned out his father, he thought his father was, was in the picture. And then there was another photograph that we had in the collection which actually showed the interior of the office. And it showed his father and then another relative who was in the picture. The collection also chronicles major decisions that were made which changed the Bronx and still have an impact to this day. As you turn the pages, you're literally seeing the history of the Bronx unfolding. You see when the, the, the land for the Grand Conquest, for example, was acquired. Uh, you see the debate over the creation of Bronx County in 1914. The collection was a labor of love for Janet Munch. We all had Bronx roots and uh, had lived, worked, studied in the Bronx. And uh, so this was a special collection for us, you know, in a, in a very real sense. The collection shows the treasures of the Bronx through its businesses. One of these treasures is the Lowe's Paradise Theater, located on the Grand Concourse. It underwent a major restoration and reopened in 2005. The Paradise Theater has a rich history. And at the time that this theater opened in September of 1929, it was the largest movie house ever erected in the Bronx with 3,767 seats. The Paradise was one of five wonder theaters in New York. These theaters were unique because of their themed motifs. And in the Paradise, it was, uh, the theme was an Italian Renaissance courtyard. So therefore, when you came in and purchased your ticket, you were actually came in and when you sat in the auditorium, you were in an outside grotto with twinkling stars and clouds floating over, overhead. The beauty of the theater is quite a sight to behold. That beauty was in danger when the Paradise was closed in 1994. The rich history of the theater was preserved when it was designated as a landmark. The theater is now open to a new generation. What was old is new again. The theater is just the way it was when it opened up. It's no longer a, a multiplex. It's a performing arts venue, and we want everybody to come down and see it, you know, to relive the past and see what the splendor was of going to the movies. Many still remember the Paradise and talk to us about the theater of their youth. And we used to come here all the time. This was our big treat to come here to the concourse to this theater and it was the biggest and most beautiful theater around. It was the only theater here in Grand Concourse. There was no other place to go, so we came to the lowest theater. I think this is a monument, it's the culture. It expresses our culture and everybody else's culture and it should never be, be torn down. It's very historical. 
with its miles of parkland and over 60 landmarks, from the botanical gardens to right here in Lowe's Paradise Theater, the Bronx is known to all. Collections like Bronx Business for Everybody showcase not only its businesses, but the richness of a community. Lou Gonzalez, Inside Lehman. Poor eating habits and the lack of good nutrition make it hard to get through the day. That's why health experts are sounding the alarm across New York City, and particularly in the Bronx. We went to see what is being done to address this serious health concern. Junk food is everywhere. It's easy to find, and that's part of the problem. New health studies indicate that New York's public school children are often substituting chips, soda, or other fatty foods for a healthy start. Now, many schools are trying to turn it around. Without a wholesome breakfast to start the day, children are unable to concentrate and get very irritable because their bodies need the nutrients it provides. Breakfast is my favorite meal, and in fact, it's the most important meal of the day for everybody, children included. We have a number of studies that show when children eat breakfast, they actually perform better in school, they have better tension spans, and they just scholastically, they achieve. According to a study released in November 2005 by the New York City Health Department, nearly half of the city's elementary school students are either overweight or obese, and 21% are obese as early as kindergarten. Here in the Bronx, at 24% overall, the rate of obesity in children and adults top the city's charts. Much of that stems from eating junk food, which is high in calories and fat, but lacking essential nutrients. The Lehman College Department of Health Sciences anticipates serious health issues in the long run. Without breakfast, you have a lower intake of certain nutrients. Um, they found that breakfast skippers, uh, interestingly enough, have higher serum cholesterol levels, which is sort of uh, counterintuitive if you think that people are eating eggs for breakfast. St. Barnabas Hospital is taking a closer look at childhood health and obesity. They partnered with the American Dairy Association and received a grant to fund educational programming for elementary school students. Public School 59 in the Bronx has reaped the benefits of this partnership, where both parents and students are learning about healthy food choices. For breakfast at home, I usually eat cereal, sometimes oatmeal or an egg. Obesity can lead to diabetes. It is the most common cause of blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, and stroke, among other issues. Obesity in general, psychologically, can lead to depression and poor self-esteem and poor self-image, which, which, which can start off when you're a child, but it will go on as an adult. And so thus, you, these people will end up with poor self-image and perhaps more serious psychological problems down the line. Getting the message out to children is the difficult part. It is important to eat grains, vegetables, fruits, dairy, and protein every day. The performing group known as Groovy Pyramid travels the country to teach kids about healthy eating. They were guests at PS59 helping to teach children and their parents about eating healthy and staying away from junk food. Using music and using melody, we can broach subjects related to diet, nutrition, and fitness that you might not be able to do in a lecture format or in a brochure. New York Giants running back Tiki Barber also made an appearance to encourage children to eat their fruits and vegetables. Everything starts at home. Um, everyone uh, talks about uh, athletes and entertainers being role models, but without parents to give them guidance, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, so I think, especially with nutrition, because mothers and fathers and, and, and home caregivers are the ones that are directly responsible. There is a relation between breakfast skippers and a higher um, BMI, which is the body mass index, which is an indicator of obesity. Preventive care may also be in short supply. Many medical insurance companies may resist paying for care that will prevent problems a decade or two later in the patient's life. They are trying not to reimburse as much for preventative care or preventative treatment for obesity. They will not reimburse you if you're just at risk for obesity. I just found out that this year my insurance would pay for me to have bariatric surgery. That's the surgery uh, to lose weight if I were morbidly obese. However, they will not pay for me to see a dietitian to counsel me to prevent poor eating and to prevent excess weight. Really, the system is backward. Children can become a part of the purchasing decisions at home. 
they may help choose different fruits and vegetables that will be incorporated in their meals, allowing the whole family to choose a healthy lifestyle. While watching TV and playing video games is part of many young people's lives, it should not occupy their entire day. Doctors suggest that children have at least 30 minutes of outdoor activity every day. Being outside the home provides stimulation and distraction from thoughtless eating. Along with the physical effects of poor nutrition comes the social pressures that go along with being overweight. Chiselli Ortiz has won the battle against obesity and is now living a healthier life. It was hard because I couldn't do everything that the kids would do and they will pick on me for being overweight. And sometimes I wouldn't even lunch because I didn't want to gain weight or I was embarrassed to eat. I'm really, really proud of her and I'm very, very happy for her. I see it in her. I see it in her when she puts on her bathing suit. I see it in her when she wears her jeans. She loves herself and I love her also. There were no rigorous gym activities offered in Chesali's school, but that didn't stop her from exercising. She also stopped drinking juice and cut down on overeating. She now drinks water regularly and pays close attention to her caloric intake. The hardest part was starting the diet, but once she saw and felt the difference, it was easy to continue. As for the tough days when junk is calling, self-motivation is important. Good thing, I'm gonna see, I wanna see you back in like two or three months, for real. Alicia Reed, Inside Lehman. Still ahead on Inside Lehman, a Nobel Prize winner says the old rules of world politics don't work anymore and that something needs to be done now. We'll tell you about her mission. And we'll step into the batter's box with some women who love the sound of the crack of the bat. Why just go to the theater when you can have the theater come to you? Marilyn Sokol, Lehman College's Emmy, Tony, and Obie Award winning distinguished lecturer, brings her tribute to Broadway legend Fanny Bryce to the Lehman stage. Hi, this is Marilyn Sokol inviting you to meet the best of Broadway and film in the Working Professionals series, which I host at Lehman College. Contact the Department of Journalism, Communication, and Theater for more info, 718-960-8217. Welcome back to Inside Lehman. A Nobel Prize winner is desperately trying to send a wake-up call to people in society who think it is someone else's job to make this world a better place. Inside Lehman's Aisha Al-Muslim reports on the mission of Jody Williams. Jody Williams received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997 as coordinator of the international campaign to ban landmines. Williams, who spoke at the annual Lehman Lecture, gained the support of organizations in 85 countries to create an international treaty banning anti-personnel mines. They're called the perfect soldier. You never have to give them a new uniform. You never have to feed them. You never give them a new order. They know what they're supposed to do. Sit there and kill or maim. And they do it for up to 100 years now because they're, many of the newer models are plastic. And as we know, plastic is not biodegradable, so they last for a long time. Williams, hosted by Lehman College President Dr. Ricardo Fernandez, addressed the necessity of increasing world security by forming new global partnerships. She cited the September 11th terrorist attack as a disturbing example of why everyone needs to see the bigger picture. We don't have to accept that their anger is righteous. Certainly terrorist responses are obscene, whether they're by a state or an individual. But we have to understand they come from somewhere. You know, these are people who are really angry at the United States continuing to say, how come our oil is under their sand? Williams oh, is right? challenging all Americans to become passionate about at least one issue and then to do something to help solve that problem. But don't complain about issues. Don't sit there and, you know, with your friends and talk about, oh, global warming is terrible, we're all going to die, or I hate racism, or we have to deal with the immigration problem. They are human beings. We shouldn't throw them out of the country then I'm going to ask you, you care about all these issues, what are you doing? And 99% of them are going to tell me nothing. And then I'm going to say to them, unless you're going to take action, don't talk to me and complain. Emotion without action for making the world better is absolutely irrelevant. Save your energy. 
Williams told her audience that the days are gone when Americans can assume that being oceans away from people earning one or two dollars a day is a reason to feel secure. She reminded everyone that the human rights we all demand carry with them responsibilities. Aisha al-Muslim in Salimin. A program to train new teachers gets underway, and the founding president of Lehman College is honored with a library dedication. It's all part of our Lehman Minute. Math and science programs, especially in urban areas across the city and state of New York, will now get a boost as more teachers prepare to add their support. Dr. Susan Pollerstock, Associate Dean of Education, is the director of the new CUNY Teacher Academy at Lehman College. We cannot prepare K-12 students uh, to compete in this kind of global economy uh, unless we do a better job educating them in math and science. It's just, uh, you know, technology is just going so quickly and we have to have students who are capable of learning these new skills and we've got to have teachers who can teach them. Students at the academy will receive incentives such as free tuition for four years, paid internships, and hands-on experience in city schools. And welcome to the Leonard Leaf Library. The library at Lehman College now bears the name of the founding president of Lehman, Dr. Leonard Leaf. Dr. Leaf guided Lehman College from its creation in 1968 until his retirement in 1990. Friends and colleagues thanked him for his commitment to academic excellence at Lehman. Under Dr. Leaf's leadership, the college library added a wealth of fine arts holdings as well as additional reference materials that have allowed students to pursue their academic research. Barbara Torres, Inside Lehman. The Lehman College women's softball team is making its mark with some of its key players showing up in national rankings. Inside Lehman's Walter Lugo takes a look at what makes this team tick. This is probably the only time you'll be cheered for stealing. This is Lucia Soufran doing one of the things she does best. In the beginning of the season, head coach Kimberly Santiama confronted her. I sat on the side with her and I told her, my goal for you this year is to have the stolen base title. And right now I think she's at 33 for 35. And Lucia stepped up to the challenge. Out of 35 attempts at stolen bases, she's only been tagged out twice in the season. She's ranked number two in the nation and is happy about that. But it's never enough. Oh, why am I not one is my question. <laughs> that was never my goal, my intention at all. I just wanted to play, have fun. But then she gave me that goal and I'm like, oh, wait, I'll give it to you. That's what you want from me? Fine. <laughs> She's not the only all-star on this team. There's also a shortstop Miguelina Reyes. Miguelina is ranked number one in two separate categories, slugging and batting. She even leads the conference in home runs. Miguelina Reyes, our shortstop, she's, she wasn't so much to teach. She came in with the knowledge and we just fine-tuned her a little bit and it shows she's leading the nation in, in batting, you know, all in D3s. One of the toughest parts about putting a team together is finding out where each player belongs. The coaches first start off with what the players bring to the tryouts. From there, they must build a team from the ground up by developing individual skills and bringing them all together as a team. We've, we've struggled at the beginning and now towards the end we're really making, we're making our mark. Practice tomorrow, 4 o'clock here. Practice, yes. <laughs> we need practice. We still need practice. They learn and they, they want to win, so they'll do whatever it takes to win. We've learned how to pick each other up when, when we're down. We used to kick each other, not really kick each other, kick ourselves, put our head down every time we made an error, but we realized that that wasn't helping us. We, you can tell in our record that wasn't helping us at all. Uh, we realized error, shake it off, there's nothing we could do about it, move on, make the next play. And that's really helped us a lot. This is a team that has come together and has also had a lot of fun in the process. Walter Lugo, Inside Lima. When we come back, what happens inside your computer when a game comes up on the screen? We'll meet some of the people who are learning how it all works. And some musical military maneuvers, love stories and life lessons in the South Pacific.
Computer games have become a huge part of entertainment in the pop culture. But do you ever wonder what it takes to bring all that action to the screen? Well, Victoria Ortega shows us how it all works. When you play a computer game or use any software, there are thousands or even millions of commands being executed by your computer. This is what you usually don't see. That is, unless you're a student of math and computer science. This type of work encompasses aspects of computer programming, graphic design, and mathematics. Lehman College students learn what goes on behind the scenes of their favorite video games by creating some of their very own. The game programs are written and designed with the same tools of the trade that are used by leading computer game manufacturers. This hands-on experience allows each student an inside look into the important underlying structure of modern computing. There's a formula, step-by-step -step formula that you can follow in order to create a game, and it involves uh, creating a game loop, which is a thread of execution that actually controls every aspect of the game. By learning to sequence computer code, the student can then build a list of instructions. Computers translate the code, which is letters and numbers, into functions such as colors, background images, movement, and sounds. More complex programming allows the player to interact with artificial environments within the video game. Looking at the various PC video game CDs and handheld video game cartridges, you have to ask, how do you make a video game? The first thing you to do is display an image on the screen by getting an image from the web or scanning one and then putting it to the computer. Um, and then it's trying to make them collide, which is you use mathematical um, algorithms to make them collide. And you want to put sounds that will be, but the main thing is it will be um, also user input. You will actually have to use their input. Applying what they've learned, the students move on to their own game design. One of the opportunities of the video game program is the chance to intern with IBM. Lehman students get to work at IBM side by side with professionals. I ended up taking a data structures course with Professor Murphy as part of my minor in computer science since my major was uh, information systems. And he recommended me to go on an interview with IBM. I've learned so many things. You learn a lot in school, but what you learn when you're actually working and you get the hands-on experience is uncomparable. As video games become more influential in our daily lives, some politicians have picked up on the current moral and social questions brought on by today's video game content. Consumers must now think about more than just the price of software. I think there's a place for ratings it, to give people information about a product before they buy it. Uh, and especially to protect children from seeing inappropriate material. As a parent of a 10-year-old boy who likes video games, I do get concerned with, uh, what, with the kind of material he plays with. And um, I do sit with him and play with him while, and watch what he, while, while he plays. With advances in video game technology, the future is wide open. While some say that we play too often and that society is becoming more isolated, Others say video games are a way to express ourselves in a safe and virtual world. Victoria Ortega, Inside Lehman. It takes a lot of hard work to recreate a Pacific island on a stage in the Bronx. Yes, it does, Alicia. And though it could be challenging to bring a classic into the 21st century, the cast and crew of South Pacific were very successful in putting it all together right here at Lehman. Inside Lehman's Daisha Harold has the story. These young performers are presenting a play that has been popular for more than half a century. Rodgers and Hammerstein's musical South Pacific first opened on Broadway on April 7, 1949. Its setting is an American military base in the tranquil South Pacific Islands during World War II. The base becomes home for nurse Nellie Forbush and her American military colleagues. Although they know an American invasion of New Guinea and the Central Pacific could begin at any time, the play focuses more on the issues that arise when Americans mingle with cultures they do not yet understand. Nellie falls in love with the man from France while struggling with the fact that he has two children from a prior relationship with the Polynesian woman. Despite its sometimes dated references, South Pacific is still considered one of the greatest musicals of all time. 
It is no wonder that the play won a Pulitzer Prize in 1950. The many stage productions that go on to this day are a testament to its success. Lehman College took on the challenge of staging this famous musical with a full orchestra. From costume to set design, the cast and crew worked hard to do the original justice. Here's how. As costume designer, Susan Sutter played a critical role because she had to recreate the 1949 look. Audiences go to see musicals expecting what has traditionally happened and particularly in the look of a show. They oftentimes get very disappointed if it's not the traditional musical that was famous. There's always people who were fought in that war or wore that uniform and you want it to be absolutely correct. With the musical demands of this play, Michael Spearman and the Orchestra of the Bronx provided their talents to bring this production back to the stage. You have a whole lot of experiences uh, coming together in a collaboration, and it includes the orchestra, which rarely plays repertoire like this, and it includes a whole lot of Lehman students, which, who rarely, if ever, sing with an orchestra like this. For Gladys Maldonado of Lehman College's theater program, it was an exciting challenge to sing with a full orchestra for the first time. Well, I've been singing one of the songs since I was 15 years old, so it's sort of, it was sort of easy, but learning the rest of the songs and hearing myself along with the accompanist, which is very different from just singing along with the recording, um, it's, it's an honor. It is. Uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein's music really comes into play because it's so stylized for the era. Working to understand and appreciate the 1940s and its music helped everyone transform the Lovinger Theater of 2006 to the South Pacific of the 1940s. Than springtime. That brought back memories for Irma Sandry, a cast member from the original Broadway production. It is unbelievably emotional to me, and it's delightful. I can't believe what you've done here. Uh, the show is being presented, the music is there. It's amazing, and of course, phenomenally emotional to me. I grew up in the show. <laughs> Daisha Harold, Inside Lehman. It was nice having you with us, but we've come to the end of our show. Thanks for watching. And as always, we want to thank our wonderful reporters and crew for all their hard work. We'll see you next time for more news from Inside Lehman.